continue to share with that. Of course, you know, we're doing a, a series right now called 44 Fire, 44 Fire, and it's 40 minutes a day, 20 minutes on the Word, and 20 minutes in worship. And you can mix that up, you know, I, there's some days, just to let you know, somebody asked me, said, how rigid do you want us to be? I want you to be spirit rigid. Okay, so fit it into your life and, and make it work. I also ask you to fast some over the next 40 days. How many of you know people can do it different ways? Somebody asked me again, well, when do you want us to do it? You want us to do it all 40 days? Absolutely. <laughs> no. <laughs> You know, I want you to fast at some point in time during the 40 days. Some people are giving up a meal. That's what I'm doing. Some people are, are giving up something that they love. You can do that. You know, some people, how many of you love Mountain Dew? How many of you love coffee? How many of you love something? Okay, give it up. How about that? And, uh, you know, because, you know, we're, we're going to look at it a little bit different today. And I gave you four different areas that we're going to concentrate on in prayer Fasting, worship, and the Word. Say them with me. Prayer, fasting, worship, and the Word. Prayer focuses us to see the new atmosphere. Fasting sets me in the atmosphere. How many of you know fasting does not move God? Now, me and, me and a buddy of mine, we get in a fuss about this, or I'll, I'll say it's a spiritual conflict about this, because some people believe that you can fast and move God in a different direction. Well, God's already provided. Come on, y'all. God's already done it. The problem is not God. The problem's you. Oh, amen, anyhow. Well, let me not make it so personal. You problem's me. Okay, and, and I mean, I know this because I'm going to share a couple of stories just to show you how intense this thing can get. But, you know, fasting sets me in that atmosphere. So what fasting does is it declares in my life, God, I'm giving something up because I want to make room, and I want to make room for more of you in my life. So in giving this up, you know, and I've heard it said this way, if you, if you fast a meal, give a meal. Do you know what? If you're fasting something, make sure you take that time to spend in the Word. You know, um, I, I had one song I played it the other night during Wednesday night service that I worshipped for over 10 minutes to one song. And it was an old song. But man, was it a good song. For me, you know, it was a good song. So do it, do it according to how you feel led in your heart to do it. Well, then the other word here was worship. Everybody say worship. Worship stabilizes and sets the atmosphere in place. Now, here's the thing, guys. I, I can pray, and prayer makes tremendous power available. All right? I can fast. Fasting moves me out of the way so that the power of God is able to flow into my life. In other words, I draw near to God. Everybody saw it, say draw near. That's what fasting does. Worship stabilizes things because when you worship in that type of atmosphere, you stabilize the worship atmosphere in your life. And that's why when you're worshiping, you get peace. Because you, you partake of God's atmosphere. You know, and we're all sensitive to atmospheric conditions. The older I get, the more I realize that atmospheric conditions affect me. All right, but I speak to my body anyway. Come on. And I tell it, okay, I know. I realize right now it's going to rain. But that doesn't mean I got to have pain to know it. So I speak to my body. So worship stabilizes and sets the atmosphere. And then the word spoken, everybody say the word destroys illegitimate or rogue or illegal atmospheric conditions. Now, this is the thing, guys. Whenever we speak the Word of God... Have you got those up there? Did you put them in? You know, whenever you take a picture of this, because understand, what we're talking about is some of this stuff. All of us have things in our lives that should not be there. We give a permission to certain things in our lives and allow those things to stay. And, you know, and, and these things, these conditions, these atmospheric forces, whatever you want to call them, are good at blending in with natural circumstance so that you don't even realize that there's something else pulling the string. And part of what we're doing is we're exposing some of those things. Now, now I'll share, you know, like I said, I'm going to share some of the things that, that have happened to me through this thing. You know, I, um, you know, I'm all for helping people. Everybody say amen to that. How many of you know we're supposed to help people? But I just don't want to help people just to help people. I want it to be a spiritual thing. Do you understand? I want to be led. I want to be led of the Spirit because most people, please understand this, most people who are asking for help sometimes don't need it. 
So, we want to be spirit-led. Everybody say it with me. I told you you're going to get tired of this. It's all spiritual. So that's what we're talking about. Now, somebody sent me a link to a uh, sermon. I think it was Miss Barbara. I think it was you. To where T.D. Jakes was teaching. And something he said during this teaching, really, um, uh, it fits in right here. So I'm going to steal part of a sermon. Well, I'm not stealing it because I told you about it. Okay, I don't want to get caught for pastoral plagiarism. And uh, you know how this kind of stupid stuff is nowadays. Anyway, it's the Word of God. How can you do that? But anyhow, um, you know, and he started talking about the promise from the purpose. And this is what he said. You can never understand the promise of the cross without understanding the purpose of the cross. Isn't that a deep statement? A lot of people never understand the promise that comes through redemption because they never understand the price that was paid to buy it for you. So to understand the promise, we got to understand the purpose. And, and it's the same thing, you know, and the Bible says, for this purpose was the Son of God manifested. Do you understand this? The whole purpose for Jesus coming here was to deliver us from Satan and his lordship. I mean, I mean, he overcome the devil. That's what he did. He not only overcome him, he defeated him once and for all. So when we understand this, now we start understanding the purpose of the cross. Now we understand the promise. You know, Pam and I, 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 mis, I misjudged the song. You know, last night I was worshiping a little bit before I went to bed. How many of you know, um, when you worship late and you're tired, there's no telling what you're going to hear. And I told her, I said, I love this song that we were playing, and it's a song we played before church, and we're probably going to end the service with it. Can you do that? Okay, while we're, you know, we might do that while we're, we're praying over the boxes. And, um, you know, and, I, and I, I told her, I said, but right at the end of the song, he says, he says something about, you know, and God, I thank you for the darkness in my life. And I said, you know what? God don't have no darkness. Will you say amen? The Bible says there is no darkness in him. God is light. Y'all with me, right? God is light. Well, you know, I told Pam, I said, let's listen to that song on the way to church. And he didn't say nothing about darkness. He said something about a job. He said, some of you need to thank God for your job. But, you know, you need to thank for it. Well, I guess some jobs are darkness. But anyway, you know, I told her, I said, I missed it. Everybody say he missed it. How many of you know sometimes, guys, we misjudge things and we hear things wrong. But we got to keep our heart right. Because the influence of our heart determines how we respond to those things. And if my heart gets soured, anybody ever had, if my heart gets stinky, I mean, if, if my thinking gets messed up, nobody can say anything to me right at that point in time. You know, parents realize this, and if I ever get in stinking thinkingville, there's no sense in her saying nothing. Because everything she says, I'm going to take it wrong. It doesn't matter the intent. I'm talking about me. I'm not talking about her. Okay, it's because how I, boy, I tell you what, my heart can influence things. Come on, y'all. My heart can influence what's said and nothing be meant at all by what was just stated, but I took it wrong. Look at the people around you and say, you took it wrong. Come on, y'all. This happens to us every time. It happens in our lives. If we get stinky thinking, we can take things wrong. And all of a sudden, everybody else is the problem, but we're not focusing on what we need to focus on. And the problem is not the other person. The problem is how you handled what the other person said. I don't need to direct you this morning, right? So we can never understand the promise of the cross without understanding the purpose of the cross. You can never understand the promise of the Holy Spirit without understanding the purpose of the Holy Spirit. We're going into this on Wednesday night, so I challenge you to be here if you can. Okay? The purpose of the Spirit is, hey, we, to receive the promise, you must understand the purpose. Everybody say the purpose. And I got a sermon series coming up on this. I started it yesterday, actually. Well, you know, let's go here. John 3.30. We're making room. Everybody say room. How many of you have ever... I went to a house one time to visit someone not here. So y'all know I'm not talking about you. But you may keep your house this way. That's totally between you and God. But I went to visit a couple in West Virginia. And uh, undoubtedly they didn't have dressers and closets because every bit of their clothes was stacked up on the couch in big piles. 
And when I went to visit, they said, well, why don't you have a seat? And I looked at the couch, and it was occupied. And she said, they're all clean, just move them out of the way. So I moved them out of the way. I think she helped me move them. And I sit down, I'm in between two piles of laundry. I mean, have you know, and, and now my mind's going, God, I hope this is clean stuff. I really, because y'all, well, anyway, you got, you got my drift, right? So I sit there. So, you know, all of us, if we're not careful, guys, we need to do some housekeeping. And part of what this is focusing on, and I want you to understand this, is making a little bit more room in your life for more of God. Because, see, I have clutter in my life. I have things that I've allowed to exist in my life that I do not need in my life. And, I, and I've, I've heard people challenge this thing different ways, but I'm, I'm going to challenge it a little bit different myself. Let's go with this. This is, this is really important. It says, he must increase. Everybody say it with me. He must increase, and I love, but, everybody say but, I must decrease. See, this is the thing that we don't think about sometimes. For God to have more of our lives, we have to give up some of our lives. And there's a sacrifice there. You know, and I got rooms in my heart that I, I, I just have not allowed certain things to happen. You know, I asked God not too long ago, because when I first went in ministry, can I, can I share with you from my heart for just a minute? When I first started pastoring and, um, and praying for people, I, I told, I, I, had, I had people getting healed all the time. Come on, everybody say healing. I had people getting healed all the time. As a matter of fact, there were certain pastors, they would call me to pray for people. And the one pastor that I, that I served with for a while, he would call me up and he said, Rick, he said, I don't know what it is about you. How many of you know it's the Holy Spirit? Okay, he said, I don't know what it is. But he said, you have more success with praying for the sick and them being healed than I do. So I'm going to send you to the sick from now. How many of you know, that, that's, it's encouraging but no fun. Because you go in and you're praying for people, but then people started getting healed. Everybody say healed. So it changed, it changed the way I think. Well, one of my things with God here lately, and you know, this is, this is part of the purpose for the, for the sermon series, is I asked God, I said, God, I'm not seeing that happen today. I'm praying for people, but they're staying sick. I'm laying hands on the sick, and I don't see them recovering. Does everybody follow me? And I know that's part of who you are. I know it's your personality. I know it's your character to heal. I know it's there. But I need to understand why it's just not happening. I'm being real here, guys. Why is it not happening? So God told me, he said, well, it's not me. My gifts and callings are without repentance. It's not me. So then he asked me what I asked him. What is the problem? So I'm taking you through what the problem is. Say amen. The problem with all of us, guys, is we just are not making room. We're not making room for him. Listen to what it says in the message translation or paraphrase. This is 29 and 30. That's why my cup is running over. Look at the people around you and say, when was the last time your cup run over? Ask them, y'all. Come on, y'all. Come on. Don't go to sleep on me now. Ask them. When was the last time your cup run over? Don't I need to come and do it for you? Come on, y'all. When was the last time your cup runneth over? Let's get all King James with it. All right, when was the last time you had an overflow in your life instead of a barely get by moment? When was the last time you sit long enough to get filled to the point to where your cup just overflowed and run all over your house so your kids, kids couldn't even stay in the house and do the things they were doing? See, we're missing something here, guys. We're crying out to God to do everything when it's already been done. And the problem is not God.
That's why my cup is running over. Listen to this, y'all. This is the assigned moment. Everybody say assigned moment. For him to move into the center while I slip off to the sidelines. Now think about that. I want you to think about it. He must increase. Are you ready? And I must decrease. He comes to the center of my life while I step off into the sidelines because it's all about him anyway. Come on, y'all, and we need to do this. Part of what we're doing this for is to get me out of the way. Do you understand? Everybody say it with me. Get me out of the way. Are y'all going to hang with me for this thing? This is going deep, and I understand that. And I'm not trying to be a gloom and doomer. You'll see as we get on into this. What I'm trying to tell you is the reason why we're not seeing the manifestation of the Spirit is because we're making no room for the Spirit in our lives. And if you'll get full at home to where your house runs over, when we come to church, are you ready? We'll have overflow. Because then you won't be just getting topped off. I was in a place, a restaurant the other day, and I don't let them refill my coffee cup until I finish my first cup of coffee. And a woman asked me, she said, why do you not do that? Why, everybody else in this restaurant. Now, why, why would that even be a problem for her? You know, because she's a server, and she don't want to see my cup. But here, I flavor my coffee the way I want it to taste. All right? And when she adds coffee to it, it disrupts my flavor. Do you follow me? And I don't want to keep trying to get my flavor back. This is natural, but I'm going to tie it in here. Pam's going, oh, my Lord, have mercy. Where is he going with this one? Listen, y'all, I, I, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll just put my hand over my cup or I'll lay a napkin over my cup. Well, I'll drink that cup of coffee and then when it gets out, I'll, she won't be around. So then I'm sitting here coffeeless. So now I'm waiting and, you know, and I know these people, you know what I'm saying, I go here a lot and, and it's, a, it's a customer. So I hold the coffee cup up in the air. And she walks by and I go, <clears throat> <clears throat> and you know what she says to me? I tried to fill it for you a little while ago, and you wouldn't let me. Now you'll wait. <laughs> and you know what I say to her? I'm paying your tip. Get me some coffee, woman. Now listen, y'all. How many of you know relationship changes everything? <laughs> she laughs. Come on, y'all. She laughs because she knows me. We pick. I laugh, but I don't get my coffee till she comes back. <laughs> so she has the last laugh. Do you follow me, guys? We have to present ourselves to God. When was the last time you had an overflow moment in your life to where God was so strong and so powerful for you and, and you let Him have so much position in your life to where you couldn't help but overflow. See, I must become less. Everybody say it with me. I must become less so that He can become more. I love the message here. I'm going to read it one more time. This is the assigned moment for him to move into center, into the center, while I slip off to the sidelines. Everybody say assigned moment. How many of you know you all can assign a moment in your life? You all can assign a time in your life. You all can assign something in your life to where you could say, you know what, God? I'm believing spiritually to be to a different level than I am right now within the next 40 days. We're seven days into it already. Seven days already. Y'all realize that? You're already seven days. You hadn't fasted, now you've got to fast more. If you hadn't done your 40 minutes, now you've got to catch up. How many of you know God is full of grace? 
Amen. Get, you don't have to catch up. Just get in, get in going with it. Listen, y'all, the other night we, we got a, and I share things from my life, and um, I've had two times to where the Holy Spirit, well, more than that, but two times that I can share. Let me do it this way. That the Holy Spirit really has corrected me about some things. And uh, one of them just happened the other night. And we got, we got a call. I don't think it'll hurt to do this, you know, from, you know, we wanted to get some coats for some of the students in schools that, that don't have coats, you know. So Pam said, um, I don't know what you had planned tonight, but tonight I want you to know we're going shopping. That is a man's favorite words to hear from his wife. We are going shopping. Because what that means is, I'm going shopping, you're going to haul me around. And I love it. No. But we went looking for coats. And so we went, and we went to one place, and, you know, and, and we know we don't want to buy stuff that's dirty, and so we were picking through things, picking out the best that we could do. And um, I got to the counter, and, you know, and, and I went, because we were, this was, we were doing it as pastors. How many of you know, a lot of times we do things as a pastor where the church pays for it, and we're just the ones that are in the process of doing it. But when I got there, you know, of course, I had the church debit card, and I went to pull out the church debit card, card, and God corrected me. Look at the people around you and say, when was the last time God corrected you? And God corrected me, and this is, this is what he said. He said, I didn't give this to you for the church to do. He said, I gave it to you for you to do. And I went, okay. So how many of you know? I got to the counter and, you know, and, and um, they rung everything up. And I, I pulled out the money and paid for it, you know. And I'm thinking in my mind, we're done. And then Pam said, no, we got another place to go. So we went to another place. And we found coats there. Now, how many of you know? Now it's starting to strain a little bit. Does everybody follow me? It's starting to strain. And, and you know, we got that done, and, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking, man, you know, God is so good to do for those who don't have. Well, then, Pam, we get in the car, and she says, now we're going to go to Walmart and buy some more. Now, how many of you know, I'm already stretching. Now we're going to go and pay full price. So we get there, you know, and we pick up, we, we didn't have a certain size and we wanted to get a certain size. And I got up there and I said, well, you know, I guess it won't hurt for the church to pay for these. And the Holy Spirit got me in the checkout line and said, this is not for the church to do. I place this in your hands. You do it. So how many of you know, we got to be open to receive. Look at the people around you and say, are you open to receive? Now, I had this happen another time, and I just share it. You know, there was one time I was at the Thunderbird Motel working on a cash register in Florence, and um, there was a family there that was burned out, and they had run out of money. And the woman knew that I was in the church in Florence, and she asked me, she said, do you think the church could help? So I called the pastor up. How many of you know it's the easiest thing to do sometimes is call the preacher? Come on, y'all. Amen. I, do it. I did it. I know. And I called the preacher up and I said, hey, you know, his family's burned out. I just wondered if the church could help. And, you know, I got the associate pastor and he said, yeah. He said, um, he said we can do it, Rick. Just, just let us know how much it is. And, you know, if you, if you feel like, you know, doing it, go ahead and do it. And then we'll reimburse you for it. And how many of you know everything was already set in place? And I, I shared this, y'all, because I'm telling you, sometimes the things of God will challenge the natural instincts that we have. I'm just teaching by example here. Does everybody follow me? Come on, y'all, you follow me, right? And, and so what I did was, you know, I, I, I went out because I'd left my debit card in the car. I was, and when I got and I reached the door handle on the car and I lifted it up, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, did I tell you to call the church about this? I mean, you know, I just let the door handle go and I'm like, where'd I miss it? Come on, y'all, ask yourself that question. Where have I missed it? Oh, come on, y'all. Where have I missed it? And he said, I put it in your way, not in the church's way. This is for you and not the church. Come on, y'all, say it with me. This is for you and not the church. 
So we ended up, I ended up taking care of it. How many of you know, God never asks us to do what we're not able to do. But this is what the Word of God has, says about this. That this assigned moment, this is the assigned moment for Him to move into the center while I slip off to the sidelines. There's obedience that comes into play. And we have to be careful about doing church instead of being the church. Now, how many of you know that's a deep thing? Because a lot of the church right now is busy just doing church. Everybody say doing church. And we are never called to do church. We're not supposed to get together and just sing a few songs and be happy. And go out of here and talk about how great it is. Talk about how good the turnout was. Talk about how good the offering was. Do you follow me? Talk about all these type of things that matter but the truth of the matter is, is we have to get back to the point to where we're not just doing church and performing as church, but we're being the church. Because everybody say this with me. I am the church. Come on, y'all. You know, the Bible also tells us we're supposed to pray for laborers. Can I change it up for just a minute? And I have prayed for this. There, there's been times I can share one story without going into any details. This happened just, just a little bit ago to where we were called and asked to intercede for something that was going on in somebody's lives. They were making a decision, and we ended up praying for that thing. And, and part of my prayer when I pray for something like that is, God, raise up people in that area. Everybody say amen to that. How many of you know if God can answer prayer, He can move on somebody else to take care of that situation? Because it was away from me. It was out of my hands. It was all the way in, in Charlotte. There was nothing I could do about it being in Florence or in Myrtle Beach. Come on, y'all. But how many of you know prayer changes things? And when we pray the right way, it changes. It shifts. I mean, it sets the cycles in motion that are godly. And I prayed with the family. And I said, God, raise somebody up. Get, bring somebody there to stop this thing from happening. Let, let there be somebody that will, will, will hear from you and do the right thing. And you know, that thing did not go through. Somebody walked up to that person and got them before they went to do what they were going to do and totally delivered the whole situation for God. Come on, y'all, there's power in what we do. We're not just going through stupid motions. We're not going through silly Christian functions. I mean, we're not going through stuff that does not matter. Everything you do is spiritual. Everything you do is important. Are y'all with me this morning? Everything we do sends ripples through all the... the I mean, all the territory that the enemy has kept for so long in this area, and it's time for us to start being the church that we're called to be. Give me a hallelujah if you agree with that. So what has God put in front of you just for you to free you from what's holding you? Do I need to say that again? What has God put in front of you just for you to free you from what's holding you? Because, see, here's the thing. God's made all of heaven available. When are we going to understand it's up to us to take advantage of everything that God says? Guys, we've got to get to a point to where we just get there and say, you know what, God? Your word is true. Say amen, y'all. You know, that settles it once and for all. I mean, how many of you believe what God says? How many of you believe the word of God? I mean, seriously. I mean, if you believe the word of God, why don't you raise your hand like you mean it? This, this is what I'm trying... We're not, we're not going through silly motions. We're seeing the power of Almighty God move in people's lives. We're seeing the evidence of what God's doing, and I'm priming the pump right now. I'm telling you, you need to get to the point to where you refuse to take anything that God says as the answer, and if it's not flowing there yet, you don't give up until it does. We're not called to surrender to life. We're called to overcome it. I'm not called to be in bondage to my circumstances. I'm called to rule my circumstances. Come on, y'all. We're called to be different. And I understand this is challenging, but let, let me tell you something. Whatever it is that God has put in front of you just for you to free you from what's holding you, you need to participate in it so you can walk in freedom. I see this happen in people's lives all the time. They'll come bound up, no peace at all. And one thing we have as Christians is peace. Or let me say it this way, we should have it. We should have peace. I can't transfer what I don't have. Do you follow me? I, I got peace inside. So there's times when I'll grab a hold of people 
And I know peace is coming because I don't have any choice but to come because I'm a person of peace. I don't go around looking for fights. I'll fight if I have to, but I'm a person of peace. And as much as lies within me, I try to live peaceably with all men. Do you understand? I mean, that's, that's what I try to do. So peace is something I have. You know, I can sit down in the midst of a storm and eat at the table of God. Oh, y'all, you need to be able to do that. Well, you don't understand what's going on in my life, Pastor. No, I don't understand what's going on in yours, but I know what goes on in mine. And there's nothing common to man. All of us are tempted in the same way. So I may not be, I, I may not got the same circumstances that you have going on, but I know God's good enough to handle it because he handled mine. You can walk in freedom. Your deliverance is purchased and free. Let me say this, walking in it cost. How many of you know, I told you this, I don't have any problem with, you know, giving myself over and just letting go of things. My problem is staying consistent in it. Do you understand? I, I can give anything up. You know, I was watching this commercial the other day, and they were talking about losing weight. How I many of you know that's just so wonderful this time of year with the holidays coming on? And the girl comes on, and she says, I even gave up bread and carbs and sugar for a day. Well, she did good. I know some people can't give it up a meal, and it just didn't work. Well, how many of you know a day ain't going to do it? So, see, anybody can commit. Everybody say commit. And, and I love this. You know, I, I told you I, I committed to praying an hour every morning and had to go back and ask forgiveness. Because the, the woman had us promise God you're going to pray an hour every morning. And I got caught up in it. And I stood up and said, okay, I'll do it. Yep, I'll do it. Well, I mean, praying an hour every morning is fun when you first do it for a day. And then a week, it starts getting a little bit different. And then a month... It just ain't so fun no more. And then two months later, you ain't doing it. But you're under condemnation because you're not. And it's just like the enemy to take something that was intended for good and then condemn you with it because you're not able to do it. Where the problem was, it should have never been a commitment in the first place. Come on, y'all. So I had to go to God, and I said, God, you know, I messed up there. I gave you my word that I was going to do it, and I'm sleeping through it. And he told me, he said, I know. I mean, <laughs> he really does. He knows. You know what he wants is for us to make room for him. He just wants us to make, bring him back into the center place of your life. Put him right in the middle. See, a lot of us will do this. We got our life and our circumstances that we're going through, and we'll take God and we'll poke him in a hole to fill a gap. And he'll fill the gap. But we never get the benefit of getting healed in that area until you bring him right into the middle of it. And then when you bring him into the middle of it, how many of you with me? You bring him in the middle of it, now it changes everything. So you move him into the center of what's going on, and now you tell that thing, step to the sidelines. You just step, and it'll, and it'll step over and move out of the way, and then God will be able to do what he needs to do in your, in your life. Let's go, let's talk about cost for just a minute. Everybody say cost. Because one of the things that I understand, guys, is whenever we start doing something like the 40 days of prayer and fasting, is it's going to be fun when you first start it off. But I'm going to tell you right now, about a week into it, how many of you realize the fun has escaped? Helium has left the balloon. Okay, there is no gas in the tank, and I understand that. And this is where we get into the point, and this is one of the reasons why I want to do this today, is because you've got to understand, cost is important. It costs God everything to get you back. Come on, y'all. It cost him everything, because there was no way man could do it. But God knew how. So he sent himself. And he hung on a cross. And he didn't just die in your stead, he became you. He took on your sin. Everything you are in a sinful state was nailed to that cross. And he delivered you and set you free. Can I say it again? 
It cost him everything. So cost, everybody say cost, is important. So let me close it out this way. If you will, go to 2 Samuel 24 and verse 18. We're going to read 18 through 25 in the New King James Version. I'm going to let you turn there because I want you to see this. 2 Samuel 24, starting in verse 18. Y'all hang in with me, right? And Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up, erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. So David, according to the word of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. Now Arana looked and saw the king and his servants coming toward him. So Arana went out and bowed before the king with his face to the ground. Then Arana said, Why, my lord, king, why, my lord, the king, come to his servant? Why do you come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor from you and build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. Now Arana said to David, Lord, let, let my lord, the king, take and offer up whatever seems good to him. Look, here are oxen for burnt sacrifices and the threshing floor and the threshing implements and the yokes for the oxen for the oxen for the wood. All these, O King Arana, has given to the king. And Arana said to the king, May the Lord your God accept you. Verse 24, everybody with me? And the king said to Arana, No, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which costs me nothing. Do you follow this, guys? I want to show you the importance of cost. David had messed up, and the people were paying a price. If I'm not mistaken right here, I think he had numbered the people. And there was a plague going through, killing the people, and he's going to make sacrifice, didn't he say, so that the plague would be stopped, so that the plague would end. And when he was offered the opportunity to sacrifice on the threshing floor, and this was, a, this was a man who understood the king's heart, come on y'all, and said, my king, you don't have to buy anything here. I need you to understand everything I have, listen to this y'all, is yours. You have the threshing floor. You have the oxen. You have the yoke of the oxen for burnt offerings. You sacrifice May God be pleased with your sacrifice. David understood cost. Come on, y'all. He understood cost. Because see, there's sometimes, see, I got to get this right. Sometimes what you're, what you're doing for God in the natural, other people want to step in and help you out of it. But it's important for you to not trust in man. but hear from your own spirit. Because for me to walk free, guys, I can't use your formula. Come on, y'all. For me to walk free, I can't use just a formula that worked for you. I can learn from it, but I need revelation from God on it. Do you understand? Because for me to walk free, God has built... His word to work precisely in my life. And this is why it's all spiritual. Because there can be a formula out there for success, and you may have some success in your life by following a formula, but if you're spirit led, it changes everything. Do you follow me? This is why David told him, Thank you, but I want to buy it all. Because I want this sacrifice to cost me. I messed up. I want it to cost me. I'm not talking about paying in the natural. What I'm talking about is making it pure from your heart. See, there's things that God puts in front of us. I'm talking about maybe, some, maybe today you're going to run into somebody that's going to need a meal. Well, they were put in front of you for you to deliver you from what's holding you. Because whatever a man sows, 
that shall they also reap. Do you follow? You see the, you see the kingdom principle in this thing. So let's, let's move the right way. Let me... Um, Let me close it down right there. Because if I go any further, I'm going I'm I'm to get off track. And I want to close it with, with doing this. You know what? I want to be so sensitive to God that I obey him on the drop of a hat. Is everybody following me? I, I want to be so sensitive to what God is putting in front of me to where I see in the spirit quicker than I do in the natural. How many of you will say amen to that? I want, I want to get to a point in my life to where I'm going. You know what, God, I understand, you know, I, I, got, I got things planned today. I got things going on today. And, uh, and God, what I'll do, because we all miss it, guys, in some way, shape, or form. You know, I, try, I tried to buy somebody food the other morning, and somebody in the store where I was at stopped me because they knew better than I knew, and I had got caught up in emotion rather than spirit. Now, would it be anything wrong with buying somebody food? Absolutely not. But see, conditions of hearts, God understands the heart because that's what he weighs. So we want to be sensitive to what God says. How many of you know, I live my life, I'm a giver. And sometimes to my own hurt sometimes is the way I do things. But I know God, and I know God honors the sacrifices that we make. So I want to close it out this way. What, what has... What has you held up from going on with God? What right now is stopping you from moving forward? What is it right now that you're saying, you know what, God, this is so important to me that I think I'll just keep a little bit of it. And that way I've got power in my life to where if I ever have to go back to it, I will. See, there's some things you just got to let go. Can I share another story from me? And I, I think I've shared it before. You know, when Pam and I, when we moved to West Virginia, the temptation for us once we got there, how many of you know we're battling things in, in territory sometimes you don't realize until you set foot in the area. Y'all, I'm telling you, North Myrtle Beach is totally different than Florence. We fight different battles. I know some people have been in Florence and they understand we, we fight a different battle in Florence than what y'all fight here at the beach. I mean, it's totally different. I know it's hard to explain, but it is. When we went to West Virginia, it was totally different. And the temptation for us was is that we had a house in Florence that hadn't sold yet. So in our minds, everybody say our minds, it wasn't no big deal if we didn't succeed because we could always come back to Florence. All we'd have to do is swallow a little pride. You know, and just tell them, well, doors didn't open. I guess God had a different... Well, no, come on, y'all. God led us there. God's not going to lead us there just to move us and then move us back. But I'm saying the temptation was to move back. Is this for somebody in here right now? The temptation was to say, you know, just leave that in place because right now, you know, with what I'm making, I can pay that payment. We can pay this payment. And then I, then I got my pacifier back there. Come on, y'all, I got my binky. You know what a binky is, right? The pacifier. See, I got something I can fall back on. And this is what we do. Can I get real, y'all? This is what we do. You know, we tell God, well, I surrender, Lord, and I give it all to you, but I'm going to keep that just in case you don't come through. And that's not total surrender. So everything went really good until the house in South Carolina sold. How many of you know? Now I don't have no backup plan. Everybody say backup plan. <laughs> now I'm out there on the edge of the limb. I, I love what Kenneth Hagin always said. He said, I hear people say, you know, get out, get out, climb up in the tree and cut the, cut, hold on to the tree and cut the limb off. He said, that's not fate. He said, fate's climbing out on the limb and cutting the tree off. Did y'all get that? That's faith. And see, sometimes faith, you don't have a backup plan. All you got is what you know the Word of God says. And you're responsible for standing on that Word. Faith is declaring where you are, what the Word of God has said, spoken 
and read, written word, come on y'all, and then standing until you see it come to pass, and then step on the solid ground that the word created, and faith created, and now start declaring it for the next level. This is what we call going from glory to glory, from precept to precept. Do you understand? God wants to move you forward, but as long as you got your binky, you're not going to go. Because see, your backup plan is more valuable than your faith at this point in time. Because just in case God does not come through, I can always go back to what I know. Can, can I share this from the Old Testament? Y'all with me? I'm going a little long. Moses has failed us, so we're going to go back and be in bondage. Because at least there, we get our selfish needs met. We got flesh in the pots. We can eat meat. How many of you know I'm a meat eater? I understand this. We eat meat. But they would have never moved to the promised land if they had stayed in bondage. Because you can't have both. It's all spiritual. Will you say amen to that? Amen. Stand to your feet, if you will. Well, that went different than I thought. Not a lot of amens in the crowd on that one. Amen. amen. Thank you. It's all spiritual, guys. Father, your word has went forth. And I believe it's challenging us to go to a new level. God, I made a declaration in my life that I'm not going to stay the same. I intend to see change. I intend to see change in me. And I intend to see change in this body. And I thank you, God, that we're going to grow up in some areas of our life and be able to accomplish everything that you want us to accomplish. So this word has been sown in our hearts. It's been sown in good ground. I want it to take root and grow. So God, I speak to the enemy that would try to steal this word, and I tell you, you have no right to it, no authority to it. God, let your Holy Spirit make it alive and let it accomplish everything in us it's supposed to accomplish because we got to get busy doing what you called us to do. Some of us have been going around the same bush now in the same mountain for years and years and years. And it's time for that change to take place. It's time for a new definition. It's time for a new redefining. It's time, God, for some new territory to be taken and that we explore things in the Spirit like we've never done before. So I declare over this body, the same thing that's always been is ceasing to exist. And a new level is on the horizon. A new level in each one of us, a new level is coming our way. We're not going to be settled for the same old, same old, but we're going to change. Will you say amen, church? Everybody say it with me. I'm hungry for more. Come on, y'all, do it again. I'm hungry for more. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody looking around right now. If you're here today and you've never prayed this prayer according to Romans 10, 9, and 10, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. With the heart you believe unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. That's a prayer. All you have to do is follow the plan that God has set in place. God loved you so much, he gave his only son so that you could have everlasting life. Would that, isn't that good, y'all? That's just good. So if, you, if you're here and you've never prayed that prayer before, I want to lead you in that prayer. Would you slip your hand up? I'm going to give just a minute. I want, I want to be sure. If you've never prayed that prayer before, I'm trying to be sure. I didn't see any hands, so if you raise your hand, I want to watch and make sure.